This is My World, The Metaphysics, and today I bring you Be Still, A Treatment Against Fear by Emmett Fox. This is the most powerful audiobook you will ever listen to that explains the 46th Psalm. That explains what to do in the time of need, when you're overcome by anxiety, fear, and worry. This book is a must. Listen to it a few times until you understand, and then go read the 46th Psalm. Learn it and use it. It will absolutely change your life. So now let's get to Be Still, A Treatment Against Fear by Emmett Fox. Be Still. The Bible teaches spiritual truths in many different ways. It gives direct teachings about God as clear and precise as any book on philosophy that has ever been written. It expounds the great message indirectly through historical narrative and by means of biographical studies, for the Bible includes the most wonderful and interesting set of human biographies that has ever been written. It contains unmatched collection of essays, treaties on the nature of God and the nature of man, the powers of the soul and the meanings of life. Consider St. John's opening section in the Gospel, for instance, or the 11th chapter of Hebrews, or the 12th and the 13th of Corinthians 1, or the 5th, 6th, 7th of Matthews, only to name a few. Each of these chapters, in a different way, gives direct and simple teachings of the truth, unsurpassed in any work outside of the Bible. But it is in its prayers and treatments that the Bible is transcendent. It contains a large number of the greatest prayers ever written, beginning, of course, with what we call the Lord's Prayer. Prayers the like of which has never been found elsewhere, for they go right down to the depths of the human soul, meeting every need that can arise and providing for every possible temperament and any conceivable contingency. In fact, they cater to all sorts of conditions of men. Among all the beautiful and heart-searching prayers of the Bible, there is none that surpasses the wonderful poem that we call the 46th Psalm. This is an inspired treatment that will enable you to overcome any kind of difficulty. If you can tune yourself into the level of consciousness to which it contains, it is a supreme Bible treatment against fear. Now, the objective of prayer and treatment is just this very arising of the consciousness and a good prayer in the instrument that enable us to do so. We need not expect to begin our prayer with a realization. If we already have a realization, we should not need the help of the prayer. We do not need a step ladder to reach a height on which we have already placed. The ladder is employed in order to enable us to raise ourselves step by step to a height above the ground to which our muscles alone will never carry us. So a good prayer is a ladder upon which we may gradually climb from the lower level of fear, doubt, and difficulty to the spiritual height where these things melt away in the light of truth. Our Psalms begin, as do nearly all the Bible prayers, with an expression of faith in God. This is extremely important in practice. You need to affirm constantly that you do believe in God, not merely as a vague, abstract concept, but as a real, vivid, actual power in life. Always available to be contacted in thought, never changing and never failing. It cannot be too strongly emphasized that it is not sufficient to take this for granted. It is not sufficient to accept the truth once and for all, or once a week. You must continuously reaffirm in a thought and in words of necessary. You must constantly remind yourself that you do accept this position, that you believe in it, and that your convictions is good enough to build your life and your hopes upon. All this is treatment, and very powerful treatment too. It is a treatment that really changes the soul by clearing out those subconscious fears that are the cause of all your difficulties. 
And so the inspired writer starts his prayer by saying bluntly, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. You will see that he allows himself no doubt at all about this. He does not dream of taking up the timid, almost apologetic attitude that some modern divines seem to think appropriate in dealing with God. He says firmly that God is, that he exists indeed, and then he enumerates three facts concerning God. He says that he is our refuge, he says that he is our strength, and he says that he is a very present help in trouble. This verse is really tremendous, is it not? If we get through the crust of familiarity that tends to hide the real meaning from us and we study these words with a fresh mind, we shall be amazed. I think at all they imply. Note that he says that God is our refuge. He does not say that such may very well be the case or that it is pious hope upon which we are justified in leaning, but that plain and plump God is our refuge. Now pause a minute to consider all God is. Review briefly at this point the principal aspects and attributes of God as you know them. And then consider that this infinite being is our refuge. That is to say, this unlimited power of wisdom and love is a refuge to which we can go in any kind of difficulty. Many devout souls have thought of God as a distant, potent dwelling in the sky, to be dread, to be feared. But the Bible says the contrary, that God is the refuge for those in difficulty. It then says that his omnipotent power is nothing less than our strength. This brings the idea home still vividly. God is not merely a matchless power that will come to our rescue, but he will actually be our own strength operating through us to the overcoming of difficulty when we call upon him in the right way. Every student of truth must understand that God always acts through us by changing our consciousness. We learn in divine metaphysics that God never does anything to us or for us, but always through us. The writer drives these points home in the familiar Bible manner by adding a very present help in trouble. The opening affirmation is followed in the most scientific way by an excellent example of the use of what he is called the metaphysics, the denial. The next two verses are a denial that there is any power in condition to make us be or do or submit to anything short of complete all around harmony. That is the divine will for all of us. It says, therefore, will not we fear as following logically upon our opening affirmations, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the water thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. The earth, of course, means manifestation. It is the Bible's terms for all one's manifestations or expressions, the body, the home, the business life, relatives, associates, all come under the heading of earth or land. We know that all these outer things are but the expression of inner states of consciousness. And here the psalmist makes us say that though the earth be removed, though all these outer things seem to go to pieces, our health breaks down, our money disappears, our friends desert us, yet we are not going to be afraid. The attitude is extraordinarily valuable. When things are going wrong, declare constantly that you are not going to be afraid or intimidated by any outer condition. The more afraid you find yourself, the more need is there for doing this. The most important time to say, God is my refuge, I am not going to be afraid, is when your knees are knocking together. The psalmist says that though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea and the waters roll and tremble until the very mountains themselves, seems to shake. He is not going to be afraid. The mountain in the Bible always mean prayer, the uplifted consciousness. This is the cause which makes us declare that even when in the midst of our prayers things seems to get worse so that the very prayers themselves are all 
but swamped by our terror or doubt or despair. Yet we are going to hold on to the truth about God, knowing that even though it be after 40 days, the water will subside. If only we hold on to the thought of God. The water, of course, are always to human personalities and more especially the emotions. The man who wrote this, we will agree, had no small knowledge of the human heart, its difficulties, and its needs. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. This is the capital river mentioned several times in Scripture, the river of life that flows from the throne of God. It means the understanding of truth that is verily the waters of life to those who attain it. The river as a symbol is rather interesting. Primarily, it stands for purpose. A river means purpose because it is always going somewhere. A river does not stay in one place like a lake or an ocean, but it is always on the way to a destination. In this respect, it is a true type of the dedicated life which every student of divine truth is supposed to be living. In this teaching, if it really means anything to us, we are no longer drifting about like a log on the mercy of the tide, but are definitely headed along the path of understanding and freedom. The city of God is a man's consciousness. Your consciousness, which is your identity in life, is called a city in the Bible. Expect the Lord to keep the city. The watchman awake waketh, but in vain. Now the conscious in which the light of truth begins to shine again after an attack of fear or unhappiness is a city purified by that holy river and it becomes a glad city, a city of God or good, a holy place for the tabernacle of the Most High. God is indeed in the midst of every city and when God, which is to say our realization of God is in the midst of our consciousness, then truly we shall not be moved. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. Here the Psalms add one of those simple touches expressed in the most direct and childlike language that goes straight to the heart. He says, God shall help her, and that right early. This beautiful promise shall remove the last traces of fear, doubt, that may linger in the dark corners of the soul. The metrical rhythm of the poem is reserved by a reiteration of the general theme in the next verse. The heathens raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, and the earth melted. The heathens neither to say means your own wrong thoughts, those fears, doubts, self-reproaches, and shortcomings of every single kind that come between you and your realization of God. The heathen forces that attack the holy city of the soul, sometimes lay siege to it for days and weeks, sometimes even capture and occupy it for a time. Only for a time, however, if you hold steadfast to the God by constant prayer, for sooner or later, as surely as God lives, the kingdom of error shall be removed. He will utter his voice through your prayers and affirmations and your salvation will come. The third and the last stanza of our treatment is an exercise of thanksgiving and praise. These Bible treatments are constructed with the utmost care and in the most scientific way, usually though not always, for there must be no hard or fast rule in prayer. They begin with an affirmation of faith in God, then they analyze fear, worry, showing that God has no part in such things and that we therefore need not fear them. They go on to remind us of the love and the power and wisdom of God and of our ability as the children of God to call upon his power in any kind of danger or trouble. They make these truths vivid to us with unexcel literary skills using the most diverse images and examples to that end. And then they commonly finish as prayers nearly always should with a song of praise and thanksgiving. Now the psalmist makes us say, The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. This destroys the feelings of God being afar off. The Lord of hosts is the title for God that stresses his great power and might. It is the omnipotence aspects of God. We shall say, technically, 
So here we declare that the omnipresence is with us and working through us. And he carefully adds that it is also the God of Jacob. Now Jacob stands for the soul that is not yet redeemed. The soul still struggling in difficulty and conscious imperfection. Israel, the prince of God, is the soul that has realized its divine nature. But Jacob is still in the midst of his troubles. So the psalmist here remind us that God is the great power, the Lord of hosts, for Jacob just as well as for Israel. Come, behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he has made in the earth. He maketh war to cease upon the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Here we continue with thanksgiving, saying in effect, Let us consider the power and the glory of this God who is always with us, how his actions and prayers transforms our conditions and make desolate or destroys our troubles and worries. He makes the wars a splendid name for worrying and stewing and misery that blinks the lives of so many people to cease in every part of our consciousness. How he disarms all the things of which we are afraid, not just putting them out of the way for the time being, but absolutely destroying any power they ever had. When you capture an enemy regiment in those days, smashing their bows and their spears and burning their chariots, you had put them out of their action pretty completely. That regiment could never trouble you again. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathens. I will be exalted in the earth. This it really is probably the most wonderful phrase of the whole Bible. It really is the whole Bible in a nutshell. Be still and know that I am God. This is just the very last thing that we want to do when we are worrying or anxious. The current of the human thought that Paul calls the cardinal mind is hurrying us along to its own ends, and it seems much easier to swim with it by accepting difficulties, by rehearsing grievances, by dwelling upon symptoms, than to draw resolutely away in thought from these things and contemplate God, which is the one way out of trouble. Train yourself to rise above the hurry and tide of error. Error is always hurried. To sweep you off your feet is its master strategy and turning you back upon conditions. However bad they may seem, be still and know that I am God. Even in your prayers, there is a time for vigorous treatment and there is always a time to cease active work and have done all to stand. Be still and know that I am God. This, of course, does not mean merely doing nothing or going away to concern oneself with some secular thing such as reading a novel or newspaper. It is being still to know that God is God. Such stillness is the reverse of laziness or inaction. The still dwelling upon God is the quietest but the most potent action of all. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Again, metrical symmetry obliges the poet to close his wonderful poem with a repetition of the general theme. Spiritually, too, it is the most powerful and effective ending to our prayer. The God of power, who helps weak and frail mortals in the day of trouble, is working through us, and so all will be well. This is the ending of Be Still by Emmett Fox.